Hi there, and thank you for watching this. This is a story recap of the first half of the Afterman book that came with the collector's edition of the album. The complete playlist will appear on screen, so if you'd like to check that out, fantastic. You can skip to the time code on screen to skip straight to the recap, rather than listening to me waffle on for a while. Unfortunately, there is no official audio version of this story so far, and what I'm doing here is a bootleg and could be removed without notice at any point in the future. This is an entirely fan-based project with no revenue getting generated for myself, and any adverts that you may have seen are due to the songs that I've sampled for each chapter of the book, which is completely understandable and fair. I'm using someone else's content to make this series, so... Yeah. Several people have notified me that the audio levels in some of the earlier episodes come through rather quietly, and to try and resolve this, I will be collecting all of the episodes of Ascension into one video with rebalanced audio for a more cohesive listening experience. If you can hear a noise going whoo in the background, that is my parrot, Oz. He is very chatty today. So, assuming that, you know, this series doesn't get taken down in the near future, and I don't get sued into oblivion by Coheed's legal department, work on the second half of the story, Dissension, has started, and as such, I'm gonna need some help with voice acting, and perhaps one or two other bits. So, for example, if you were to look at my Vaxis Part 1 storyline, it is pretty clear I cannot and do not sound like a woman at all, and I can only do about four or five voices in general. So, you know, there's some that are I'm a monster sort of thing. So if you would like to help out with that in the future, leave me a comment. That would be truly appreciated. Once again, thank you guys for leaving me feedback and comments. It's super cool to hear from you guys. So without further ado, this is the story recap for the Afterman Ascension. Chapter 1. The Hollow. In the beginning of this tale, Cyrus Amory has left his home and his love behind to venture forth into the great unknown of the Keywork, a strange entity that binds the 78 planets of Heaven's Fence together. Fueled by his quest for knowledge and forsaking everything he holds dear, he is determined to learn and understand what this energy is. Joined by a custom artificial intelligence of his own design called All Mother, the two throw caution to the wind and step out into the unknown. Chapter 2. Domino the Destitute As Cyrus leaves his ship the merry well behind, he is met with an incredible blue that swirls and shifts from navy to the lightest of aquamarine. Cyrus begins to collect samples of this atmosphere, which is unlike anything the scientific community could have anticipated. Adrenaline floods his body as the realization hits him. He is the first man to enter this unknown. This elation was short-lived, as the sound says, la, 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 entered his ears. Control began to leave his body as the first entity attempted to hijack his mind. This was Domino the Destitute, a former boxer who fell into the trappings of power and fame and was forced into committing crimes on behalf of a local gangster. This sadistic man forced a wedge between Domino and his brother Chess as Domino fell deeper into the abyss of crime. This possession ended as Cyrus witnessed the final brutal moments of Domino's life and was forced to take control by shooting himself in the head. This act of violence was so destructive, it resonated through All Mother, back to the Merrywell, causing it to explode in the quiet of space. Chapter 3. The Afterman Meanwhile, on Valencine, the home of Cyrus and his wife Mary, she is preparing for another day after deciding to throw herself into her work in the absence of her husband. Prior to him leaving, she understood there was no way that she could convince her husband to stay, as the life he would lead. She knew the allure of the unknown was too much for a man like him. She had wished for a normal life, with a child or two, where they could take holidays and plan for the future, not to see him leave on a suicide mission. Her mind wandered from the fluff piece of journalism that she was writing and searched for current events to distract herself. Dozens of stories filled the air via hologram, but one catches her eye and takes away her breath. Breaking news. Controversial researcher Cyrus Amory feared dead 
after unexplained explosion, ending privately funded endeavor to self-professed key work. She reads and rereads the headline as disbelief engulfs her and the slow realization the love of her life had died. The tears flowed with no end as journalists flocked to her door like vultures surrounding a carcass to get a reaction. But she still has hope in her heart. Cyrus would defy the odds and come home again. Chapter 4 Mothers of Men Cyrus was alive and struggled to piece together what had just happened to him. It's as if he's in a maze surrounded by infinite souls that echo as an energy in the beams of the keywork. Some energies are positive, reflecting their good lives, and some are tormented here, as they were in life. He understands there is still so much to learn in this void. These souls all contribute towards the same end, emitting an energy regardless of if it is comprised of hate, joy, sadness, or virtue. It is clear there is tremendous unrest here, as those who have led good lives are trapped in the same afterlife as the worst society can offer. Cyrus is like a beacon to these souls. The good wish for recognition of their deeds, and the bad seek salvation as they cannot attain change in death. Falling deeper into the keywork, Cyrus discovers the mono, a parallel world beyond that repeats their lives until even the greatest of victories and the happiest of memories become mundane due to the never-ending cycle of repetition. In this space, Cyrus begins to lose focus and tries to remember Mary to regain his mental bearings, ranging from the most wonderful moments of their lives together to the most subtle of thoughts, such as her smile as she slept. Using these memories as a foothold, Cyrus is able to peel back a layer of this space, as if it was tangible, revealing a warm glow with colours more vivid and stunning than anything he had ever perceived before. In awe of this incredible sight, he felt unable to name this fantastic space. However, this small pocket closed up again, and returned to the monochromatic depths once more. Chapter 5 Good night, fair lady. Time, as it transpires, moves at a far different rate in the key work compared to the rest of reality. Six months have passed on Valentine since Cyrus was pronounced dead by the media. Mary, in the months since then, had fallen into a deep depression, attempting to deal with the absolute devastation that she had endured by losing her spouse. Friends and family tried to get her to move on with her life, and encouraged her to re-enter society. With this in mind, she decided to go to a pub known as the Fair Lady, where she could have a conversation with someone that didn't look at her with sympathetic eyes, and overhear them discussing her. Widow. A local scumbag named Grinlock approached her, and took the stool beside her, noting the wedding band on her finger, and inquired as to why a man would leave someone so beautiful to drink alone. Her mind raced, as the realization she was not ready to re-enter the world again dawned on her. He continued to try and impress her before knocking her drink on the floor, causing it to smash. <sighs> Tears formed in the corner of her eyes as she tried to leave before being handed another drink by way of an apology from Grinlock. She was unaware he had drugged her drink with the most foul of intentions, and offered some words of encouragement. Sometimes it's a lot easier to see the glass half full with the glass half empty. Do you want to talk about it? She began to raise the glass to her lips, and a stranger stepped over and placed his hand over the top. This was Officer Graves Colton, an undercover officer who had attempted to arrest Grinlock for months and had finally caught him in the act. Colton politely asked Mary to give a statement the following day at the station, and handed a card over to her. Little does she know, the officer will eventually become her new love interest. Chapter 6 Hollywood the Cracked Elsewhere, Cyrus is busy collecting samples of the energies that surround him, remaining cautious so not to disrupt the potentially volatile atmosphere he's in. Other thoughts begin to cloud his mind. What if Mary was right? And he would die out here 
And how far would his nutrient supply built into his suit last? Suddenly, a second entity approached and attempted to assume control of his mind. She was Hollywood the Cracked, a woman fixated on the concepts of fame, fortune, and idol worship, the names of those she adored carved into her flesh, complementing the multiple surgeries she had endured to resemble her idol, Madame Crisis Moreau. After receiving a restraining order for breaking into MCM's home, Holly felt pushed to take drastic action. This culminated in Holly waiting outside of a public appearance of MCM's before firing five shots at the starlet and receiving a bullet herself aimed by Cyrus in the mind of one of MCM's security team. Cyrus's actions once again cause this reality to crumble as a sinister voice calls from the void proclaiming, He's mine. Chapter 7 Vic the Butcher Vic the Butcher forced Holly out of his way as his vessel, Cyrus, became engulfed in the tormented, twisted path of Vic's existence. Vic was a cruel, malicious army lieutenant general who treated his own men as little more than pawns, and far worse for those he considered his enemies. Every victory he attained was showered with praise and admiration for his actions, but very few knew of the lengths he would go to win. He created a culture of fear within his own men that allowed him to command this broken tribe into committing barbarous acts. Anyone who argued or disagreed would be swiftly executed as his brainwashed platoon marched forth. Many of the wounds his men sustained on the battlefield were at his hands. These men returned home broken, beaten, and terrified of their leader, the Bookcher, far too scared to let the world know of this monster's action. One man, a young sergeant major named Sentry, would defy the orders of Vic, only to be met with swift retribution. This came after he was ordered to bomb a nearby camp of insurgents. Knowing full well the number of innocents in this area far outweighed that of enemy forces. And Sentry, to his credit, stood by his morals and argued this went well outside of the parameters of protocol and they should try and separate the insurgents to protect the lives of the innocent. Sentry informed Vic of his intentions to report this decision to a field marshal within their platoon. But later that night, Sentry was kidnapped from his barracks by Vic's squad and hung in a quiet corner of the barracks. His family were notified of a suicide. He couldn't deal with the intense stress of this life. Cyrus witnessed these actions and his mind raced. Surely this had to be the defining moment where he could break the possession and free himself from the monster's grip. Sentry struggled for his life as he writhed and twisted, hanging by a rope. Cyrus again attempts to regain control and grab a service pistol from the waist of a nearby soldier to shoot Vic, but it's intangible. He cannot grab it. The illusion springs forward in time as Vic is an old man. He is retired with his wife and attempting to avoid the spotlight. A trial was due as evidence of Vic's heinous acts throughout his bloodstained career had finally caught up to him and justice was to be served in the very near future. But a creature like Vic refused to take responsibility for his actions and decided to set the building ablaze, pouring gasoline in the basement of the building, knowing full well the tower block they lived in would have hundreds of casualties including those of a nursery block on the bottom floor. This, this moment was the end of Vic the Butcher. Cyrus was able to justify his actions every other time he had escaped possession, but now, as the flame flickered in his hands, he couldn't go through with it. Would Cyrus be morally responsible for those deaths if he allowed himself to light the fire to escape? The moral question weighed on him for what felt like an eternity as he decided to extinguish the flame and allow the spirit of Vic to take over. All Mother whispered to the unconscious Cyrus, his strength is going and he will surely die. Chapter 8 Evagria the Faithful Vic encroached into every fibre of Cyrus's being and as he is being consumed by this evil, all Mother announces 
another unidentified entity is approaching. The fog lifts as Cyrus is bathed in a warm light and feels a peaceful energy pulling him away from Vic. Slowly becoming revitalized by this entity, he glimpses into the second plane of the afterlife. It is wondrous. It is beautiful. And one that is incomprehensible all at once. Cyrus is lifted higher and higher, surrounded by this light protecting him, as the other entities swarm and wish to do him harm. This entity is known as Evagria, a truly beautiful soul and allows for Cyrus to see her life, which unlike every other, isn't a confusing distorted maze, but more akin to a flowing river. He witnesses her strength in life. She adopted children at risk, and gave them the best future they could possibly have. Later in life, she was the first to volunteer at a hospital, as political protests tore apart her city, and offered care and support to everyone. Regardless of ideology or belief, even if they lie in stark contradiction to her own beliefs. This compassion throughout her life ensured when she finally lie on her deathbed from a rare bone disease, cruelly striking at middle age, she was surrounded by friends, family, and loved ones. She had imparted her love and morals onto each of them. And even in death, she was helping those in need. But Evagria only has so much strength, which is being diminished rapidly by the other entities. Chapter 9. Subtraction. In this loving embrace, Cyrus is offered clarity and a chance to reflect on the journey so far and thinks about the complexities of the afterlife. He was drawn towards the key work for answers. Others were unable to find them. But in this state of contemplation, he realized he lacked many of the benefits others in his field had, such as camaraderie, a collaboration with others. But he instead armed himself with determination and perseverance. But these qualities had forced a wedge between him and his wife. Thinking back on his marriage to his beloved Mary, he understood the many missed opportunities he could have seized to save her from this great pain he knew she would endure in his absence. He thought of all the moments he had spent in the key work and wished he could have shared them with her, which left him with one lingering question in his mind. When his time comes to merge with the energies of the key work, would his path be that of his drive and determination to explore the unknown or end with the deep regret of abandoning his wife? And so concludes the first half of the Afterman story. This was the Afterman Ascension recap. Written by Claudio Sanchez, edited by Chandra Eckhart and Blaze James. Dissension will be coming soon. Thank you for your time. Stay safe and stay among the fence. Tara. <laughs>